Hello, everybody, and welcome back. When we left last time, we were talking about uh, Longinus and we were talking about sublimation, and I sort of breezed over that, and I still probably will breeze over that, but I wanted to mention a few things that are actually important. First of all, Long uh, Longinus really um, helps us out with understanding something that's going to be coming about very, very quickly, and that is the idea of the aesthetic the artistic. And I don't mean in terms of proofs, I mean in terms of style. Now, obviously, Cicero really hammered home the idea of style. Of course he did. He That was his thing. He believed that that was the only way to achieve what you need to achieve with an audience. However, what he was talking about when he said that we should put the audience in the right mindset, that we should make them pliable, and we should know how to do that, and a good order knows how to do that. He was really talking about what Longinus was talking about. He was talking about that idea of putting the audience into a different place than where they are, a place where they want to listen to you. I guarantee you, there are at least a few of you who are staring at the back wall, trying to figure out what kind of flowers are on my wall, or what that picture is. I mean, we try to get rid of distractions, but you're looking at a timer, really, and you don't even have to be looking at me. You could be doing something else right now. So there are so many things that will take you away from what I'm saying. And so there's, there's this balance between the speaker, the order, getting your attention, maintaining your attention, giving you new information, educating you, and being, you know, entertaining in some way, usually. And that balance has to counter with, there are some very dry topics out there that I need to cover and I need you to understand those things. So how do I keep your attention while staying on topic? And that's not exactly new. I mean, teachers back to Aristotle were talking about it. <laughs> so you will look for any distraction possible. How do I make you listen to me, understand my words, see my nonverbals, but not be distracted by me or the environment. And that answer actually comes through Longinus in some ways. That idea of taking your audience to a different level or a different place than where they are so that when they're listening to you, they're not thinking about what you're wearing. They're not thinking about the picture behind me. They're not thinking about um, the clock on the wall or what's going on upstairs uh, or what's going on downstairs, as the case may be. They are concerned only with the content of what I need to tell them. And this is why content is important to Cicero as well. I mean, he does not blow off content. Please do not think that he does. And in fact, when I talk about Cicero specifically, I'm going to talk more about that in his plan for education for the young. But he does tell us that we have to find that balance. So if I don't want to distract you, but I want to keep your attention and I want you to listen to me, but I don't want your full attention on me as a speaker, but the content of what's coming out of my mouth, then I'm somehow going to have to find a way to be invisible, make sure that the environment around you is very, very comfortable, that you don't care about me, but you care about what I'm saying. And that is not an easy thing to do. The fact that Longinus talks about it in terms of sublimation makes a little bit of sense. If your audience is uncomfortable, they're not going to listen to you, which, by the way, is a great argument for why online teaching is great. You should be incredibly comfortable right now. I am not. Why not? Why did I not make myself comfortable? Well, if in order to make myself comfortable, there's so many things I have to do, right? And I've got to be able to position the iPad or the computer or the phone, whatever I'm using in order to make it make sure that I look right. I've got to get the right lighting going on. I've got to keep my back straight. Uh, I need to keep myself in the frame as much as I possibly can. So I can't have a swivel rocker when I'm trying to talk to you, especially if I don't want to distract you um, and instead get you to um, listen to what I'm saying, not what's going on with my bobbing head every time I move the camera. And so therefore, there's another thing that comes up, and that's our own vanity. And believe me, Cicero was vain, okay? He thought he was the greatest thing ever, 
And I have to tell you a little side note here, just so that you do know some of the context. Right next to me is this huge cage. It's about four feet by three feet. Um, and it's got my, uh, my, my, my first gecko. He's a super giant. So he's actually like this big. I'm not even kidding you. That's like, he's really long. Um, and he looks like a miniature dinosaur and his name is Cicero. And every time I say it, he looks up at me from his nap. I don't know what he's doing, but he's cut, he comes out of his cave. He's like, what did you call me? So he knows his name, which is kind of funny, but yes, he, he was in fact named after the great orator. And Cicero was vain a little bit, but perhaps it was very much deserved. How is it possible that that much vanity was deserved? Well, perhaps you also need vanity in order to be a good orator, because if you're going to be willing to get up in front of people, and at the time they didn't really look at it so much as taking a risk by being in front of people, but they definitely took it as you have a lot of work to do before you get in front of people, a lot of work to do, then you need to be not comfortable in the sense of I feel good today, but comfortable in the sense of I know that I'm delivering the best possible content in the best possible way at this time. The truth of the matter is that there are several things that make that impossible for me. Number one, natural light. I don't look good in it. I've got a sun lamp here. It's not helping. Number two, high definition doesn't make anybody look good. I never realized how old Seth Meyers looked until we switched to high def. Um, and you're not going to cover up any of the flaws that you would normally cover up. I can't be far away from you enough um, and still talk to you in a reasonable way vis-a-vis -vis, uh, this format without you seeing every single flaw every time my eyes flutter uh, or, or whatever, whatever is going to distract you. So there's a lot of things working against me anyway from the get-go. You put a combination of all those things together, how am I going to overcome that? You're not. I'm not going to turn perfectly porcelain and beautiful uh, enough to, to not distract you uh, with, with blemishes or flaws. None of us can do that. That's, that's a ridiculous idea. Um, you know, instead, I have to put you in a place where you don't care about that stuff. And that's where the process of sublimation comes in. So what Longinus really gives us in between, you know, Aristotle and Cicero is he gives us the idea of the audience and putting the audience where they need to be in order to receive the information that we want to give. There's another piece that I want to talk about that some people attribute to Cicero and others say, no, uh, there was a guy named uh, Hermagoras. Um, and others say it's anonymous. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say none of that's reliable, so we're going to go with anonymous. But I like to attribute it to Cicero because I feel like it's him when I read it. And that's the adherenium. The adherenium is what gives us the basis for our court system. It gives us something called the stasis system. Yes, you've heard that word before. What does that mean? I thought stasis was a thing or a place or a concept or an idea of where we exist in order to start rhetoric. Uh, yeah, it's where a choice is made, right? So all those examples I gave you earlier, beautiful, ugly, good, bad, um, should, should not. How about that translates into guilt and innocence? Well, now all of a sudden we have a different question because it's not like we can determine guilt or innocence based on how we feel that day. That's not what you're supposed to do in the courtroom. So what really gets set up in the ad herenium is a series of questions in a very specific manner that are arranged in order to draw out the right, uh, the truth, honestly. I mean, in the ad herenium, they, this is how you get to the truth. You ask these questions as they may be relevant to the case. And if you do that, then you're going to be successful in the courtroom in winning whatever that might mean for you, whether you're defending or whether you're um, accusing. Wow. Rhetoric started with accusing and defending. Imagine that. It started with really with the defense of Helen. It starts with the stories from Homer and, um, and, and, and the other guy whose name is escaping me at the moment. That's horrible. Uh, the Odyssey, the Iliad, right? This, these are the things where we start to practice rhetoric when there's that question usually about a human. So attacking and defending is a good majority of what rhetoric is based on. So the stasis system actually gives us 
this really good core place to start. And if any of you go to law school or you went to law school or you are a paralegal or you've been in a courtroom, which some of us have been way too many times for reasons not in our control and has nothing to do with criminal, most of the time civil, right? But if you've ever been in a courtroom and if you ever had to be cross-examined, which I have had the good fortune of never having to be, you know, never having that, but when I practiced it, um, and that's to say not in law, but in a uh, mock trial, um, you know, that idea that we would ask questions in a certain order in order to get to the answer that we want at the end is still being taught today as the basis for law. So if you are interested in law, um, I would really attach yourself to the Rhetorica at Herenium as a place to start thinking about stasis and how it functions in a social institution like a courtroom. Okay, I'm going to finish that there because that's going to take us to Cicero now. Um, between Aristotle and Cicero, um, Longinus and, and the Ad Herenium. Um, and now let's focus on Cicero in the next video. I'll be back with you very soon.